Meet Sarah, a 33-year-old woman who noticed an unusual change in her eating habits. Her cravings for salty snacks had gotten out of control. What started as an occasional indulgence had turned into an obsession, and she found herself finishing an entire jar of pickles each day. That's a lot of pickles, but this was more than just a craving. Little did she know that this was actually the first sign of a serious medical condition that would change the rest of her life. For the past few months, Sarah hadn't felt like herself. She was tired, and these salt cravings had become so intense. Each time she walked by the kitchen, she'd reach for the pickle jar, open a bag of chips, or grab some popcorn. And at mealtimes, she was practically coating her food in extra salt. At the same time, she just couldn't quench her thirst. Sarah had never been big on drinking water. In the past, she'd actually needed to use a water tracking app to make sure she was getting enough. But these days, she had an unquenchable thirst and she was guzzling back liters of water per day. Then the nausea and gnawing stomach pains started. She tried taking antacids and changing her diet, but nothing seemed to help. So she told one of her friends about it, who thought it sounded like she was pregnant. Fatigue, nausea, weird cravings, maybe they were right. So Sarah took three different pregnancy tests but they were all negative. Next, she noticed she was losing weight without even trying. Then one morning she woke up with a cough and her whole body was aching. She figured it was just a cold, but when she stood up, she became really lightheaded with spots filling her vision, warning her that she was about to pass out. Things went from bad to worse that day, and it wasn't long before Sarah couldn't even go from lying down to sitting up without becoming extremely dizzy. That's when Sarah knew that she had to go to the hospital. In the emergency department, the nurse took her blood pressure while she was lying down, which was 90 over 50. She'd always had low blood pressure, but this was lower than usual. Then the nurse asked her to sit up in bed. And just like before, Sarah started feeling dizzy again, and her blood pressure dropped to 80 over 40. She also had a fever and an elevated heart rate. And although she was breathing a little bit faster and she had a productive cough, her oxygen levels were still normal. The emergency doctor ordered a chest x-ray and some blood work to investigate. Looking at the chest x-ray, you can see here that there's an obvious pneumonia, and that explains the fever and cough. Then her blood work returned, showing multiple abnormalities. Her white blood cell counts were elevated, which is consistent with pneumonia, but concerningly, her creatinine was elevated, suggesting a kidney injury. Plus, her potassium was a bit high at 5.1, not in the danger zone yet, but if potassium gets too high, it can cause your heart to stop. Despite all the salty foods she was eating, her sodium levels were actually low. The emergency doctor gave Sarah a diagnosis of sepsis secondary to pneumonia. Sepsis is a life-threatening condition where the immune system overreacts to an infection, leading to inflammation and organ damage. And the key is early recognition and treatment. So Sarah was immediately started on broad-spectrum antibiotics and IV fluids before being admitted to hospital for observation. Pretty straightforward, right? But this isn't your typical case of sepsis, as we'll soon find out. The next morning, the internal medicine specialist reviewed Sarah's chart and looked at her morning blood work. Her kidney function had returned to normal. Good and just as I'd expect after getting rehydrated with IV fluids. But what was unusual is that her sodium was still a bit low and her potassium was still a bit high and her blood pressure was persistently low. That's not what I would expect from a typical pneumonia. And when your patient isn't responding to treatments the way you'd expect, that's the moment to step back, look at things again, and make sure that you have the right diagnosis. Now, there are many causes of low sodium that we need to consider. And similarly, there's a long list of conditions that cause low blood pressure. Then it's picking out which conditions overlap and can cause both symptoms sort of like a matching game. With these potential causes in mind, the internal medicine physician went to assess Sarah, and this is what she found. First, she noticed that Sarah was quite tan, even though it was the fall and she didn't spend time in the sun or use tanning beds. Next, she asked Sarah to stick out her tongue and saw this distinct brown markings on the bottom of her tongue. That's hyperpigmentation, and it's a major clue for what's going on. The pieces of the puzzle are connecting. Salt cravings, abdominal pain, low blood pressure, electrolyte abnormalities, and now, hyperpigmentation. This is an adrenal crisis. Sarah's adrenal glands aren't working properly. They're not making the hormones they're supposed to, which can be life-threatening. And it's all because she has Addison's disease, also known as primary adrenal insufficiency. 
One thing I find so exciting about this case is that looking at the tongue was crucial for making a timely diagnosis. Your tongue can tell you a surprising amount about your health. And I actually made a whole video talking about specific things to watch out for. Now, to understand how an adrenal crisis caused Sarah's symptoms, we need to take a deep dive into the adrenal glands. These amazing organs sit on top of the kidneys like little hats, and each layer is responsible for creating a different hormone that's essential for keeping you alive. Think of it like a layered cake with different flavors. The outer layer makes aldosterone, a hormone that regulates sodium and potassium in the kidney. In simple terms, aldosterone makes the kidney retain sodium in your body and pee out potassium. In Sarah's case, without aldosterone, salt was flowing out of her through her urine and extra water was going with it. That's why she was experiencing the salt cravings and why she became so dehydrated with unquenchable thirst, dizziness, and low blood pressure. The next layer of the adrenal gland makes cortisol. A lack of cortisol caused Sarah's nausea, abdominal pain, weight loss, and hyperpigmentation. Most often this happens in areas of friction, like the way your teeth run along the bottom of your tongue. The next layer is DHEA, which is a precursor for testosterone and estrogen. Missing this one isn't life-threatening, but it can affect your mood, energy, and bone density. And last, but definitely not least, the innermost part of the adrenal gland makes stress hormones like epinephrine, which people commonly call adrenaline or the fight or flight hormone. And a fun fact, the inner core of the adrenal gland is actually quite distinct. I won't get into embryology, but it's a totally different type of tissue even though we lump it in with the rest of the adrenal gland. And as a result, it usually remains functional in Addison's disease even when the rest of the adrenal gland is failing. So now we're left with the question, why did her adrenal glands all of a sudden stop working? Well, most of the time, Addison's disease is caused by your own immune system attacking the adrenal glands, an autoimmune process. And that's what happened to Sarah. An antibody called 21-hydroxylase was found in her blood. And this attacks an important enzyme in the adrenal gland. Okay, so we know what caused the Addison's disease, but what triggered the adrenal crisis? Well, this process, this autoimmune destruction of the adrenal glands likely happened gradually over the course of months. Our bodies are incredibly good at adapting. And most of the time, people don't develop any symptoms until 90% of their adrenal cortex is destroyed by the immune system. But then Sarah got pneumonia, which put her body under much more stress. And her body needed to have more cortisol to keep her blood pressure normal, but of course, her adrenal glands just couldn't produce it. That's when things went from a slowly developing issue to a crisis and a medical emergency. So what happened with Sarah? The good news is that Addison's disease is treatable. Although we can't replace her adrenal glands, at least not yet, we do have medications that can replace the missing hormones. So Sarah was prescribed hydrocortisone pills to replace the cortisol, and fludrocortisone to replace the aldosterone. The tricky part is that she now has to actually regulate the amount of hormone she's getting depending on the stresses she encounters. Like if she gets sick or needs an operation, or even if she's going through a really emotional time like grieving, she'll need more hydrocortisone. And because it's so critical, Sarah now has an emergency hydrocortisone injection kit and a medical alert bracelet. This way, if she ever goes unconscious, healthcare providers can quickly understand what needs to be done in an emergency. So take a moment to feel gratitude for your adrenal glands, a part of the body that we never really stop to think about until it's not working. This video was adapted from a peer-reviewed article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. So I'll leave a link in the description if you wanna learn more. Click that like button as a way to tell me if you wanna see more videos like this. Be sure to subscribe, and that way I'll see you in the next video. So, bye for now.